I want you to close your eyes and imagine something for me, Taplines listener. Imagine, if you will, the brewing industry before the mainstream adoption of Instagram or even Facebook. Before the rise and fall of influential forums like RateBeer.com or Beer Advocate. Way before the launch of the Millennial Dad Validation Engine, commonly known as Untapped. In this halcyon Web 1.0 past, the notion of drinkers traveling far and wide just for a chance to get their hands on coveted IPAs or limited release stouts or whatever it was fairly limited. With notable exceptions here and there, people mostly just kind of went to their supermarket or the local bottle shop or a nearby brewery, bought some beer, and left without being freaks about it. But throughout the aughts, as craft beer's popularity rose roughly in tandem with social media and blogs and eBay and all the other modern conveniences slash curses of this digital age, things started to get a little weird. People began to post. And some of them began to post about beer. Real sicko shit. (laughs) I'm mostly kidding. But the fact is that as American beer drinkers got more online, they also got a lot more willing, even excited, to stand on lines for the opportunity to buy the beers that they'd read and heard about from their fellow enthusiasts in these new digital town squares. In 2010, these two shifting paradigms, craft beer and social media, would collide in spectacular fashion at Northern California's Russian River Brewing Company. Husband and wife co-owners Vince and Natalie Chalurzo opened their brewery's taproom one wintry Saturday morning, expecting a chill day, slinging pints and growlers of their highly rated, award-winning triple IPA, Pliny the Younger. What they got instead was one of the first major examples of the online craft beer hype machine's offline impact. Today on Tap Lines, we're joined by none other than Natalie Chalurzo herself to tell us about that fateful February day when Russian River's fortunes changed for good, and when the rest of the craft brewing industry learned that when your beer gets internet famous, you should expect a bunch of dudes from the internet to show up and wait in line for it out front. It's Pliny the Younger. It's Natalie Chillers of Russian River Brewing Company. It's the birth of craft beer line culture. And it's all right here, right now, only on Vine Pairs Tap Lines. Yes, Natalie Chillers of Russian River Brewing Company. Welcome to Tap Lines. Hi, good morning. Thank you for having me. It's morning where you are. It's afternoon where we are. Natalie, where are you joining us from today? I am sitting in my office. Oh, I guess it is afternoon. <laughs> um, just barely. I'm uh, sitting in my office at our Windsor Brewery today. And that's one That's one of two for those who are not for, uh, familiar with Russian River Brewing Company. Uh, and they will get very familiar over the course of our episode today. <laughs> but uh, the original tap room location for Russian and production brewery location for Russian River is in uh, Santa Rosa. Is that right? Uh, well, actually, uh, Russian River Brewing Company was originally located out at Corbell Champagne Cellars in Guerneville. Um, it was founded in 1997, and my husband was the brewmaster uh, there and um, also the sole employee for a long time. But um, that Corbell owned it for about six years, and then in 2003, they chose to close um, the brewery and offered um, Vinny the brand Russian River Brewing Company and all of the recipes that he developed and beer names, some of which include Pliny the Elder and Damnation and Temptation, um, and um, and offered him the all of that in lieu of severance. And so uh, we took the brand and all of his recipes and beer names and uh, wrote a business plan and convinced uh, thirty friends, family, and strangers to invest a ton of money and into our new venture and we reopened under new ownership under our ownership in downtown Santa Rosa in April of 2004. So yeah, so our, our Santa Rosa pub for any of your listeners who've ever been there is the original location under our ownership. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Natalie, we're here today to talk about a phenomenon, I think in contemporary craft beer, uh, certainly American uh, craft beer as an industry and as a community that, um, really hit hard last decade, uh, early last decade, we started seeing consumer behavior change. And I think there were a lot of reasons for this. Of course, the rise of social media being a huge one. But uh, the phenomenon I'm referring to is this idea of lining up to get 
beer, like, you know, to, to purchase special releases of beer. I mean, this was certainly a thing that happened um, earlier than that. Um, but you know, right around, uh, the turn of that decade. So going into the 2010s, there started to be more sort of, I don't know, a- ambient excitement, nascent excitement about some of these harder to get, um, you know, sort of bigger flavored limited release beers. And one of the ones that we talk about a lot here at Taplines HQ and is sort of, I would say no matter who you are is in the canon, uh, of American, uh, craft beer is, uh, Pliny the Elder and, and a little bit later on Pliny the Younger. These, these beers are just iconic. Their names command an enormous amount of respect and attention, even though they are not at this point, new beers. But, um, I was hoping that you could take us back to the creation of, of these beers before they were, you know, these enormous sort of titans of the style that they are now. Sure. Yeah. Well, I'll start with Pliny the Elder because that was first. So um, Pliny the Elder is a double IPA, um, one of the first um, commercially brewed double IPAs um, that um, Vinny created in 1999 in response to a request from one of uh, his accounts at the time, one of our still long-term accounts, um, the Bistro in Hayward, California, here in the Bay Area. Vic called Vinny and said, hey, I, I understand you um, You made a double IPA at Blind Pig, which which he did, was, which the Blind Pig, Blind Pig was the brewery that Vinny owned previously in uh, the 1990s in Temecula. Um, it was his first brewery project. <laughs> so Vinny made uh, a beer called Inaugural Ale, which was kind of technically a double IPA. At least the recipe was at the time. Of course, there was no style called that at the time. And uh, right. so um, Vinny agreed to brew a double IPA for Vic's double IPA festival at the Bistro in 1999. And he had invited eight breweries. Um, it was us. I think it was Arnie at Marin Brewing. Um, handful of others. Not not too many people because nobody really brewed this style. And so uh, Vinny, Vinny and I talked about, well, what are we going to name this beer? And so we, we pulled out beer books. This is pre-Google. And um, we started looking up, uh, you know, ideas and we looked up hops and, you know, led us to, um, you know, Humulus Lupulus, which is the botanical name for hops, which led us to Lupus Selectarius, which was the original botanical name for hops, which led us to this guy named Pliny the Elder or Pliny the Elder, as he likely would have called himself um, 2,000 years ago. He lived from 23 AD to 79 AD, and he wrote a lot about botany, geology, geography, um, military strategy. He was an author. Um, He was a Roman naturalist, and he wrote about hops, and he wrote about how hops grow. He wrote about different uses for hops, and he wrote the first um, kind of technically book of encyclopedia. It was a three-volume set called The Natural History. And in one of these books, he wrote a lot about hops. And we were like, that's a really cool name for a beer. We're going to call it Pliny the Elder. Being that we are Americans, you know, American English, it is a long I (laughs) with one consonant. So that is why we call it Pliny uh, with a long I. Um, Plus it also rhymes with tiny. So when you order a half pint, you order a tiny Pliny. Uh, So for your listeners Which is the best. Which is the best, (laughs) yeah. So if you, uh, I'm sure many of your listeners out there are like, it's pronounced Pliny. Well, you are correct, uh, but that's not the way we pronounce the name of the beer. So um, that was in 1999. And literally that is why that beer was born. It would have been born eventually, um, but it was what is uh, in response to a request for a beer festival, which is going strong to this day. We were just there in February at the Bistro Double IPA Festival. <laughs> but there are a lot, more, a lot more than eight breweries and eight beers represented now. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> which is So cool. it, in 1999, yeah. Natalie, uh, I'm hoping you might be able to sort of contextualize for the, for the listener out there who was not either in the scene or, I mean, at this point, maybe wasn't even alive in 1999 because those folks are, yep, now legally are able to legally drink, right? Yeah. They're 22 <laughs> years old. Um, there was a moment, or now, uh, you know, a double IPA, I don't want to say it's de rigueur, but it's certainly much more familiar, right? Like this has become mm-hmm. normalized where, and, and we've gone beyond that as a, uh, as a, as a drinking public, right? There are triple IPAs and we'll get to that in just a bit. Um, but in context, how 
out there was the double IPA as a pseudo style. Cause as you mentioned, it wasn't even a style at that time. It was out there. I mean, you know, for many of your listeners who have ever been to the great American beer festival, or if they're in the industry and they've been to the craft brewers conference and have entered beers into the world beer cup, that was not a style at the time. Um, according to the judging categories. So, uh, we would enter Pliny the Elder in, I think we've entered it in the strong pale ale category or a strong, yeah, it was like a strong pale ale or a strong, maybe just the IPA category. Um, experimental other, um, was another category at the time that I'm pretty sure we entered, uh, elder in, but, um, uh, but I also want to make note that, um, it was only draft. So it wasn't mm. a bottled product. Um, Back in those days. In fact, um, we never bottled it until we opened our first production brewery in 2008. So it went almost about 10 years uh, as a draft-only product. And you could really only um, get it on tap at our um, at the time at Corbell um, or at just a handful of accounts, um, literally, because I think Vinny like, at maximum made about 1,200 barrels uh, one year while at Corbell. Wow. So it was a pretty small, small operation. And even when we opened our brew pub in downtown in 2004, um, we were really only brewing about 3,000 barrels a year. So it was pretty, pretty small um, back in those days. So um, yeah, it was, uh, it, it did become more popular as time went on, uh, but didn't really, you know, it was definitely a slow burn. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, it, and, and to your point, you know, back in those days, there weren't a lot of double IPAs. There certainly was nothing called a triple IPA at the time. And I think the, uh, the beer-consuming public was just starting to get used to copious amounts of hops and alcohol and, um, and then eventually um, craving more. Um, but it took some time. They got hooked, yeah, but yeah. only after only after maybe they tasted some Pliny the Elder. I mean, one of the <laughs> jokes that I've read over the years, and I don't know if this originated uh, at Russian River, it's just something that fans of your beer have said, but the pronunciation discrepancy between Pliny and Pliny, it, not only can you order a tiny Pliny, but Pliny rhymes with Piney, which is that big hop forward flavor that I think a lot of people encountered for the first time in that era. So that's like another fun little... <laughs> Uh, even though it might not be accurate to say to say Pliny, I always liked that uh, <laughs> little little rhyme, little rhyme feature. Yeah. Before we before we move on to the younger and to the the line culture at hand, I just I mean it's I, I just want to emphasize for listeners who are not familiar with Russian River or uh, you know or P Pliny the Elder, just how much of a sea change this beer was to the national scene at the time. And I'm going to quote from uh, uh, Jeff Allworth, who writes the the Beervana blog, which has been around for for a long, long time. Not quite as long as, uh, as Russian River, but probably getting up there. Um, <laughs> and he said, Jeff wrote about uh, Pliny the Elder. He wrote, quote, in 1954, Roger Bannister broke the four-minute mile and redefined what runners thought was possible. Pliny was like that. It tasted like an IPA. It was recognizable, but it was so much more intensely flavored and scented, and the presentation was so sharp and crisp and intentional. In the space of a pint, we saw possibilities we hadn't imagined before, close quote. And, and it set the stage for the moment that this episode is principally focused on, which is this, uh, you know, this turn towards um, more, you know, coveted, more, even more hop forward beers that are getting buzz and getting interest from people who have never, who have never tasted them before and who are out to go, you know, what we would later refer to maybe as whale hunting, right? Like go, go mm -hmm. try to find these, these coveted beers. And so that brings us more or less to the, um, to the beginning, what, what I'd like to talk about next. And I think you were about to go there yourself, which is, which is the, uh, the genesis of, of Pliny the Younger, who in real life was Pliny the Elder's nephew, I think. Mm -hmm. Nephew? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but in uh, fast forward a couple millennia, and it is uh, Pliny the Elder, uh, double IPA's uh, triple IPA off offspring. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Definitely a triple IPA offspring. That's a, a good way to put it. So um, yeah. So for, uh, for just a little historical perspective, um, when we opened our uh, brew pub in 2004, um, 
times were very different than they are now. So there was not um, a huge demand for craft beer. There certainly was not a huge demand for, um, you know, cult beers or beers that were um, highly sought after. That was not a thing at the time. Mm. And so um, when we opened our brew pub, uh, we were very, very slow. Um, for anybody who's ever been to our brew pub in Santa Rosa and maybe had to wait to get in the door, um, it hasn't always been like that. And um, for a lot of breweries that um, have opened their their uh, breweries or tap rooms in the last, say, five to maybe seven or eight years, um, you've you've opened your doors with a with a ready market. <laughs> um, but the world wasn't quite ready for what we were offering at the time. And so in, uh, in the, the winter of 2004 to 2005, the very first winter that we were open, we decided that um, we needed to drum up some business um, to pay the bills. And so um, we, um, we talked about brewing um, like a seasonal, a winter seasonal, but uh, Vinny wanted to push the envelope on the Pliny the Elder recipe and see how far he could go with alcohol and hops um, and still make a balanced product, um, which is a challenge for any brewers out there. You know that, you know, if you have too much alcohol in your beer, it's hot. If you have too many hops, it can get get bitter or, you know, back in those days, more bitter, there wasn't a lot of the... Um, uh, what we would call designer hops or the proprietary hops. There wasn't sure. mosaic, there wasn't citra, um, but there was this hop called Simcoe. And Simcoe was, has always been the primary hop in Pliny the Elder. And so Vinny decided to take that recipe, bump up the malt bill, um, which, you know, by design would then bump up the, the finishing gravity, which is, or yeah, which would then be the alcohol, and then um, also add more hops and like literally kind of triple <laughs> the, mo- the hop bill. And um, and he came up with this recipe. We decided to call it Pliny the Younger because you know of of the historical people. You have Pliny the Elders, you know, nephew and adopted son Pliny the Younger. Pliny the Younger also is one of the reasons that we know so much about Pliny the Elder because um, he was also a writer and and an, and an attorney, and he was able to write about his nephew's life and also, or his uncle's life. And his uncle, um, Pliny the Elder, died during the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, by the way, historically. Right. Of interest. He was, uh, <laughs> he was like on a rescue mission for a buddy, I think. And he, he, uh, he is asphyxiated, if I'm not mistaken. That's my understanding. Yeah. So, so anyway, so we brewed this beer in, in the dead of winter. We released it in February of 2005. So this is the 19th annual release of uh of Pliny the Younger. We're actually in the middle of the release, by the way, for your listeners. Yes. Um we released it uh last Friday on March twenty fourth and um uh, we have it on tap um and in bottles nowadays um through April sixth. So we're right in the middle of the release and I thought this was great timing to talk to you about this phenomenon um, that we call Pliny the Younger. Um, so that year, um, we released it with no hoopla and fanfare, and um, the beer was well-received. People really enjoyed it. And um, we made 20 barrels of it, and uh, it was gone after, in a and while. This is, yeah. this is 2005, right? So 2000, mm-hmm. winter 2004 slash 2005. The beer gets released 2005 winter. Yeah. Yeah, February yeah, of 2005. Okay. And then gotcha. uh, and then that was that. And so year after year, we continued to brew Pliny the Younger as our winter seasonal offering and release it in February. Generally, that first Friday in February is when about that time that we would release it. And, um, and that happened until, um, until everything changed in 2010. Until everything changed. In those intervening, you know, five years... What was the response like? I mean, you said that the that Pliny the Younger was successful. People liked it. You brewed twenty barrels that first year. Can you characterize a little bit? You know what customers were sort of, you know how much thirst there was for this product. It seems like it became a little bit of an event prior to twenty ten, but still pretty localized. Yeah, definitely very localized. Um, it was you know we only made twenty barrels of it probably for the first two years. Maybe we bumped it up to a double batch, um, maybe forty barrels. So by the way. This the yields on this beer. Our brew house is a twenty barrel brew house at our original pub in downtown Santa Rosa, but the yields are more like fourteen barrels. So mm. it's it's a very very inefficient beer to make um, because there's so many ingredients, so much malt, 
and so many hops and that takes up a lot of volume in the kettle and it displaces liquid and at the end of the day you need liquid to become beer and so we um the yields were just so bad so it's a very very expensive beer to make and the yields are horrible and it takes longer too because it's bigger so it takes longer um to ferment so we would make it um every year i honestly i i don't really recall any um uh, too much excitement about the beer. I know people liked it. Um, I don't know that they really went out of their way to get it. Um, maybe, maybe in 2009 that started to change a little bit, but I, I really don't remember anybody like, Ooh, I can't wait to come out with Pliny the Younger, or I'm planning to make a trip from wherever um, right. to, uh, to drink your Pliny the Younger. <laughs> so I don't yeah, really yeah. remember that. <laughs> yeah. And that was certainly, like we said, like I said, towards the top of the episode, that was, that culture in and of itself was still kind of coalescing. That was still very much fringe behavior, um, you know, at that time, right? Like that was not just not something normal people, quote unquote, were, were entertaining, uh, the idea of doing spending a weekend sleeping in their Volvo outside of the brewery. No, no, it definitely wasn't. That wasn't, uh, it was there was not, a there was not any kind of like community like that around, around beer yet, but it was, it was definitely brewing no pun intended, but it was definitely Hey-o. starting to percolate. And, um, uh, it was, it was coming, but you know, we didn't really know that cause we were just yeah. running our little pub in downtown Santa Rosa and weren't really familiar with, you know, just weren't really paying attention to what was going on outside of our little world just because we were just trying to make the best beer we could and, um, you know, get by and pay our bills and, um, pay our staff and, you know, do what we could to, keep the lights on but um yeah that things were things were definitely changing um in the world um uh, particularly in relation to things like social media and uh, sure. chat rooms and stuff like that uh what are some of those like platforms or factors that you mm-hmm. point to as like particular factors here um, well, the two platforms that I'm refer that I was, you know, thinking of earlier, um, are, were ratebeer.com and mm. beeradvocate.com. And those were like the first two beer rating sites that had, you know, a forum where people could go on and say, you know, review beers. I tried this beer and this is what I think about it. And I'm going to give it a four stars or five stars or whatever their rating systems are. And, um, there were, there, there, I don't know if there was parameters around, you know, you had, it had to be so many words or whatever. I think they do things like that now just to keep the riffraff right. out <laughs> or maybe <laughs> subscription based. I'm not, I don't really remember, but we weren't, um, really, um, paying attention to that at the time. We weren't, um, vi- you know, we weren't really tech savvy and weren't, um, we just, just didn't know this was really going on. We'd heard about it, but you know, those were in those days, um, you know, you relied on your newsletter or your blog to get, Mm. to get the word out, you know, to your customer. I mean, we still do it, but not nearly as much as we used to do back in the day because you didn't have, you know, you didn't have social media. You didn't have a way to communicate, um, with, um, with customers or with with fans or whatever. The only way to do it was to collect a, good old fashioned mailing list and send them a newsletter, uh, via email. But that was, that was really it. That's all you had. Or if you had money, you know, you spend money on traditional forms of, of advertising and print media and, um, radio advertising or whatever. But, um, you know, we didn't have any money. So, you know, the newsletter <laughs> right, right. <laughs> who has money. Um, but yeah, so what there is was, that? Yeah. what is that? So there was this beer advocate.com and this rate beer.com and, and, beer savvy beer nerds were were getting on there and they're all over, from all over the world and they're chatting with each other almost real time and and telling each other like wow I had this beer and and it was really amazing and you know and there's there's like people in foreign countries and they're talking about 
West Flutter and 12 and they're talking about Orval and they're talking about, you know, Cantillon and, and, you know, here in the United States, they're talking about Bells and, and Sierra Nevada and I guess Russian River, <laughs> unbeknownst to us. Right. Um, and it probably unbeknownst to any of those other breweries. I'm, I'm confident <laughs> that the monks in Belgium had no idea this was going on. <laughs> so I don't feel as bad. If the monks didn't right. know, why should we know? Um, yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, so that's, that's kind of when, when everything changed and yeah. um, this was happening in the background and, People were rating our beers without us even knowing it. <laughs> uh, and this brings us to this moment that we've been sort of talking around on this episode mm-hmm. so far. And in, in 2010, in February 2010, mm-hmm. this was the moment that um, Tom Asatelli in his book, Audacity of Hops, he highlights. This was this was the moment that we've been referring to here when everything kind of changed for Pliny the Younger mm-hmm. um, and for Russian River to some extent as well, because you found yourself on the other end of the cash register from those teeming hordes who were desperate for this beer. And so I was hoping that you could take us take us there and, and tell us what that was like uh, that the 13 years ago, roughly, um, mm-hmm. you know, when everything when all hell kind of broke loose for uh, for Russian River and Pliny the Younger. Yeah, so it literally was um, one day in the history of our company that changed everything. And I I like to compare Pliny the Younger to a bar band. Um, like this band, you know, just goes, they, plays, they play gigs night after night. You know, they pay, get paid, you know, a hundred bucks in beer and they're just going out and they're just doing their thing and they're, and they love it and they're passionate about it. And then, and then one night, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a record label scout in the audience. And, and I kind of, I like to make that analogy because, um, cause that's kind of what happened with Pliny the Younger. It was never received with any hoopla and fanfare until 2010 so what happened was um, we were um, releasing the beer as usual Friday morning, 2010, and the first Friday in February. And um, we had uh, invited some friends to come up for lunch. And, um, you know, because Pliny the Younger was starting to become um, an event, if you will. Like, a re- it's just a release, you know, like, hey, we're releasing Pliny the Younger. Oh, great. We'll come up, bring some people for lunch. I think it was like Pete Slosberg, formerly of... Pete's Wicked Ale and our friend Judy Ale, Ashworth, a um, couple other people from the Bay Area are going to come up. We're going to have lunch with them. And uh, I had just had uh, knee surgery as well, and so I wasn't wasn't getting around real well. What a perfect and storm here! We oh, were, no. uh, yeah, we were planning to uh, get the doors open, you know, get things rolling with Pliny the Younger, get the beer tapped, you know, open at eleven, have lunch with our friends, and then go to our production brewery and um, and work. And that was the day, and then we would go home and go to bed and whatever. <laughs> so it was just, that was the plan. So, um, Vinny gets down to the pub that morning about seven o'clock and, um, he's just going to tap the beer, tap the plane of the younger and then, you know, whatever, just go to work. And, um, and there, there are people out front and he walks out the front and he's like, hi, uh, what are you guys doing here? We don't open for four hours. <laughs> And they're well, well, we're here. We're here for your beer. We're here for, you know, Pliny the Younger. And um, he's like, oh, okay. Well, we don't like I said, we don't open for like for four hours. So you know, when and how do you know about this beer anyway? Like we only make it here. It's only right. available here, and it's only available like in a handful of accounts. Like how do you even know about this beer? And they go, well, well, haven't you heard? Your beer has been rated the best beer in the world. And Vinny goes, by whom? <laughs> like, <laughs> like who, who knows about this beer? Who is rating this beer and decided that it is the best beer in the world? And uh, they said, well, there's this, these, these beer rating websites, beeradvocate.com and rapier.com. And on one of them, your beer was rated the second best beer in the world. And I think it was second to West Flutter in 12 that year. And, Good company uh, to be in. And then the other one, you're rated the best beer in the world. We were like, so I know, okay. All right. Well, that's fine. Well, you guys can hang out. We don't open for four hours. So, so in the course of that four hours, um, the line continued to grow um, down Fourth Street. We, by the way, we had never, ever, ever had a line or anybody even waiting 
to come into our brew pub prior to this first Friday in February in 2010. Um, and I'm sure, you know, most breweries had never experienced such a thing. Um, so we opened the doors, I, you know, I got down there, he called me and he was telling me that this, this thing was going on and there were these people like waiting in line out front. And so I get down there a little early and, you know, we're getting the doors open and stuff. And so these are the early days of our company. We really weren't that busy. We didn't have security. Um, we really didn't have a lot of support staff. Um, you know, we didn't hold the doors. We have a front door and a, and a back door. And so 11 o'clock rolls around. Um, we turn on both the open signs, we unlock the front door and we unlock the back door. Not only is there a line of people standing out front on D street, but there are all the cars in the back parking lot are full of people. And so both doors open and within about five minutes, the entire pub was completely full. And if anybody has ever been in the restaurant industry knows that that's really a bad thing because then all of a sudden you have 130 people placing drink orders, placing food orders. And, and it's just, it's, it's not an ideal way to seat a restaurant. We didn't even have, we just, people just sat down. We didn't even have somebody like trying to see people. <clears throat> so I was um, going to help out behind the bar for a little bit. And then, like I said, have lunch <laughs> with our friends and then um, just have a nice chill day. Yeah. <laughs> that was the plan. So, um, we we knew that we we kind of felt like we were going to get a little bit of a bigger turnout. So we decided to limit growlers of Pliny the Younger to four per person. So you could get growlers <laughs> of Younger to four, four, to four, four per person. It's so much beer by today's allotment standards, right? So <laughs> much like... beer. Because we didn't, we didn't package it. We didn't bottle of it. Course, and of course. Of course not. It was on draft. We made 40 <laughs> barrels of this beer. And so, um, so every person who walked in the door ordered uh, one 10 ounce glass of Pliny the Younger and four growlers. And so, <laughs> so um, everybody who's, who's listening to this story, who's like I said, been in the restaurant industry is like cringing at this moment. So um, if you've ever had nightmares about the wheel going off, either if you worked behind the bar or worked in the kitchen. So the wheel is literally popping off. It's like a roll of toilet paper. It's just like, yeah. you know, it's just rolling. Oh, no. It's all over the floor. It's just <laughs> everywhere. So I, uh, I stationed myself at the tap behind the bar because I can work the wheel. It's And the wheel's here and the younger tap is here. Vinny, like, um, I think he made another younger tap at the other end of the tap towers uh, the tap lines the taps come right off off the cold box so it's a whole wall sure. of taps so i think he i think he might have made another younger tap over there splice this one so that i could pour half pints and then i could pour growlers at the same time and then he went back and started um filling growlers um off of the server because we were using a server and um, and then anybody who came in, we just we just put to work because it was just so busy. We'd had employees coming in, we wanted to taste the beer and get a growler. We had all of our friends showing up. We had other brewers that we put to work. <laughs> so it was wild. So like, so if you picture like a party of four walks in the door and they order four 10 ounce glasses of Pliny the Younger and 16 growlers. <laughs> yeah. Immediately that, weeds. And you're was just, just in the weeds. Yeah. <laughs> order after order after order. And it was just the same thing. And eventually I just stopped even looking at the tickets. And I was just, we were just filling, we were just putting glasses and growlers at the end of the bar. I think we were just reloading the growler boxes with full growlers of Pliny the Younger so that the service could just take you know, boxes and boxes of growlers, the tables. It was, it was insane. It was, I've never seen anything like it. The service was, it was by far the worst day of service in the history of our company because we just couldn't <laughs> take care of everybody. Um, I knew was it was, the I knew it was bad when um, somebody actually ordered a pizza to be delivered from another restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> that's when we knew things were really bad because our kitchen was so backed up. Yeah, I think so. I At one point I looked up and there was like a Mary's pizza uh, delivery person from the next block was coming in and delivering pizza to table six, I think. Looking back, it was really funny, but at the time it, it wasn't really funny at all. So I remember by like 1110 that morning, we had made, we had completely changed the way we would ever ever release Pliny the Younger again. We were like, we need security. We need wristbands. We need a hostess. We need, we will never, ever, ever do growlers again. I remember 
11, 10, we would, we were never, ever doing growlers again. And so, um, so it ended up being a, being a pretty rough day. Um, like I started this whole story, I had just had knee surgery. And so oh. I ended up bar backing for a solid eight hours. I was just covered with beer because I had to lean up on the bar, back bar and sure. I was just soaked with beer. And, um, uh, we poured, um, I'll never forget this. We filled 815 growlers in about <laughs> eight hours. <laughs> I oh still remember that gosh. number. Um, we, we, uh, Vinny and I left, I don't know what time we left. We literally like just limped and carried each other out of there. Uh, Vinny was sick. He, uh, by the way, he was sick. <laughs> had a fever. So he oh, was working man. in the cold box with a fever. He ended up in the emergency room the next day. This was uh, his like Michael Jordan with the flu game, basically. Something. Like, yeah. yeah. Um, so he rose to the occasion. We yeah. ended up uh, we ended up selling all the beer in about eight hours. So 40, not even 40 barrels of beer, whatever the net was. But we sold all the beer in about eight hours. And then the, the night shift, the night crew, um, they just got beat up because, you know, they came to work. They had younger for about an hour before they ran out. And um, I think it was about seven o'clock that night. I got a, a phone call that they had just run out applying to the younger. And then, and then the rest of the night, they were just dealing with angry drunks. <laughs> all sure, night. right on their yeah. hands almost. Yeah, you know, back in those days, we didn't have uh, we didn't have table limits. Like you couldn't, you know, we weren't telling people you have to leave. Um, people were literally like. You know, they would get up from their their table and they would go and get back in line and they would come back in and then and start the whole process over and right. order another sixteen growlers and um, you know that's when um, I started um, really getting into um, uh, the black market of beer um, and 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 starting to really push my my uh, my distaste for the whole black market of beer um, because growlers of Pliny the Younger were showing up on eBay um, before we even opened that morning. And, um, so I had already been watching eBay, um, you know, to see our beer, um, for sale for ridiculous amounts of money. Um, so, so that was another reason that we were like, yeah, well, we can't handle the growlers, but also it's quite frustrating that, you know, we had right. such a rough day and yet there were people, you know, reselling our beer for, you know, a thousand bucks for a growler sure. on eBay or something. And so, um, so yeah, so that was the day that everything changed that we, um, we just, it was a rough day. Um, it was a, it was an eye opening day. We, we, we started paying attention <laughs> more to rapebeer.com and beeradvocate.com. Yeah. And, um, you know, and, and then, you know, social media started to, to come online. And, and so that was a, that was a really, that was the turning point in the history of, of, of not only Pliny the Younger, but also, uh, beer releases in general, because I remember that a lot of other breweries, um, you know, would, would have similar experiences, um, when they released a highly sought after beer that they didn't realize was as highly sought after. Um, I seem to remember Cigar City had, um, a beer release back in the day that went sideways. And I remember Lost Abbey had a beer release that went sideways. Sure. And, and by the way, that wasn't our only beer release that went sideways. We, we had a bottle release for one of our, uh, for beatification, which is our spontaneously fermented, um, beer. And uh, we had a bottle release that, that had gone to sideways because it was really hard to gauge. Uh, I mean, we always say there are two things we can't control the weather and how many people show up. And that is true to this day. And there's nobody out there who can predict, I mean, the weather, you can't control it. You can predict it, but you can't control it. And you can't control how many people come to a public release. You can sell tickets, but that's that's not what we're doing here. This is not sure, a ticket event. That changes the dynamic. That yeah, changes yeah. the dynamic and it makes it exclusive and it makes yep. it, and it, and it just, and it limits, you know, how it's just, it's not what we're trying to do here and it, and it never was and it never will be. And so, um, and so, yeah, so all over the years, um, Pliny the Younger has evolved into what it is today. And, um, like I always say as well, um, it's business as usual inside the, the event is outside. <laughs> That's where it's going on. <laughs> That's where we learned a couple lessons. Yeah, 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 we've learned a lot. We've learned a lot, and we're we've learned we could probably give a master's class on crowd control and 
all that stuff. One year, um, so we started doing wristbands, right? And um, you have to think like a criminal, right? So right. Uh, one a year- dr- A drunk criminal. Yeah, a yeah. drunk criminal. You have to think like a drunk criminal. Um, <laughs> somebody went down to Party City here on Santa Rosa Avenue and bought the same color wristbands that we had. Because I didn't realize that we had to have custom wristbands because you have to think like a criminal. And right. they started selling wristbands in line. And um, <laughs> they were coming through the back door. They would just go show their wristband to back sure. door and just say, oh, I went out the front to have a smoke. I'm just coming in the back. Oh, no problem. You know, security let them in. And right. I remember I remember um, looking up at one point. There was like uh, 200 people in the building. And we only had seating <laughs> for about 130. And there was like... We're like three deep at the bar. There's just bodies everywhere. And we were like, how did that happen? And then somebody in the line told us, oh, there was this person they were selling the same color wristbands to people in the line. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot of the things that you're describing learning through trial and error back in 2010 have since become mm-hmm. the default, the standard for uh, for coveted releases, right? No growlers, limited allotment, table limits, uh, you know, like you can only um, go through the line once, right? Like a lot of this stuff, uh, you were you were breaking new ground at that time. I'm, I'm, but it also strikes me as like a moment where, um, you know, uh, you kind of realize like, oh man, if we don't keep an eye on this, like the inmates are going to run the asylum here. Mm-hmm. Like your craft beer customers, enthusiasts are like, are not afraid to try to get one over on us here. <laughs> Do you think of it that way? Because like I certainly not specific to Russian Rivers customers, but like I certainly like I you know I read the forums, I read the Instagram comments, I li- you know think about like we hear about like people who are like you know pressing their grandma into service to be like another one of the other people in line so they can get double the allotment, right? Like this is mm-hmm. behavior that I don't think like. Prior to, you know, this, this moment, you know, the, the early 2010s or whatever, this was not something that really dominated the, the beer industry. It was not something that was prevalent, right? Mm-mm. No, it's, yeah. it's, it is fascinating to me when you come across somebody who's standing in line and they don't, you can tell that they don't really understand what right. they're doing, but you know, like their, their kid, you know, lives out of the area, said, you need to go and stand in this line and you need to buy me two bottles of Pliny the Younger right? and you need to ship it to me and wherever I live. And you, you can, you can tell right. that like the parent or the grandparent is like, I don't, I don't drink beer. I don't really want to be here, but yet I'm doing this <laughs> for my kid because I love them. And, and I'm like, well, you know, that's not really cool. Like, <laughs> you know, I don't right. think that's really very nice of your kid to make you do this um, because it's not something that you're into because, because all these other people around you are, they're really into it. They're really excited to be here. This is their 15th year. This is their third year. Um, You know, they're, they're having reunions with, with friends or with family. Um, They do this every year. Um, There was a bachelor party here on Saturday that they all flew out from Salt Lake city and the bachelor party was coming to, to Pliny the Younger. You cool. know, coming for the whole experience of standing in line with all these other like-minded people from all over the world, and then you know having the full Russian River experience when they came inside. And there's, you know, there's there's people celebrating their wedding anniversary here today. <laughs> there's, there's all kinds of fun stuff going on. You know, there's uh, one day there was two 40th birthday parties and two 60th birthday parties, and so people really make a special occasion. Um, out of coming to Pliny the Younger. And, and we, we just, we love that. And that means so much to us. And so I, I feel really bad when, when somebody has been talked into doing something that, that they really don't want to be doing and, and they're just, yeah. they don't want to be here. And they're like, is there another line for the bottles? And I'm like, you didn't see all these people standing in line. They want bottles too. So no, there's not another line for the bottles. You can, right. that's all you right. want. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and on one hand, it's like, okay, maybe there's an opportunity to bring these people into beer. But on the other, like you said, this has become something bigger. And whenever something gets bigger, there's people who come to it for different reasons. Mm -hmm. And some of those reasons aren't always as kind of like wholesome and, and, uh, and, and, uh, you know, sort of like uplifting as others, I suppose. No, Um, for sure. I haven't looked online, but I can guarantee you plenty of the younger bottles are all over, all over the, the place. Um, like I'm on, I'm on this one website that I'm not going to mention because I hate them. I will look it up. (laughs) 
You're always welcome to name names on tap lines, Natalie. You should just know that. (laughs) I don't want anybody to get any ideas and then start going there and buying beer because the problem is there's a market. If there wasn't a market for the black market, then it wouldn't be a problem. But because, so here it is. Here's the website. I'll show you. I'll show you. Mm -hmm. This is Pliny the Younger. Yep. Pliny the Younger. Pliny the Younger. That's, you know, whatever. There's more pages. There's like more pages. Yeah, there's uh-huh. multiple pages there. Yeah, yeah right. it's, uh, you know, Pliny the Younger, free shipping <laughs> 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 for, oh, 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 one bottle of each, uh, Pliny the Younger, Pliny the Elder, free shipping for $145. <laughs> oh, my goodness. In retail, what would that cost in 2023, Natalie? If one, we came to- one bottle of Pliny the Younger and one bottle of Pliny the Elder is going to set you back about, uh, let's see, uh, $20. Right. So, I mean, we're talking about just a, a, a tremendous, a egregious markup, right? It's an egregious markup, yeah, and it's and – it's, uh, yeah, I can't look at this. It makes my blood pressure go up. <laughs> All right. Well, let's take the blood pressure back down. And and I'm curious, you know, in the midst of all this, something, you know, that's as much of a phenomenon as Pliny the Younger endures more or less. I mean, what I was going to ask is, I mean, there's a continuity there that is, frankly, as a journalist who's been covering the space, kind of shocking. I mean, it's like I said, it's a canonical beer, but people just take this really seriously and have all the way through. I'm curious what kind of changes you've seen over the course of maybe the past three, four, five years, you know, towards the back half of last decade and into this one um, with regards to people's relationship to Pliny the Younger. I mean, at, from where I'm sitting on the opposite coast, of course, uh, so I'm not as close to it, but from where I'm sitting, it remains as much of an event as ever. I'm curious, what does it look like for you who who is is behind the bar, so to speak? Well, we're we're living it right now. So we are on day six of our 2023 Pliny the Younger release. So um, what we find surprising is that year after year, um, people keep showing up. Uh, a lot of people keep showing up. Um, they're willing to uh, take time off work, um, spend money to be here because they are traveling from out of the area. Um, they're willing to stand in line for, um, Saturday, it was five to six hours, um, to get in. Um, and they, but they know what they're getting into after all of these years. And so, you know, it was a little surprising, I think for the first few years, like a lot of very few people come to our Pliny the Younger release now who do not understand what they're getting into. I met a guy, Mm -hmm. I did meet a guy on uh, Saturday and he came up to me and, and he was from the Bay area and he was like, I've never been to this before, you know, what's going on? What do I expect? And I was like, (laughs) oh, okay. And so, you know, I took a few minutes to explain to him what was going on, give him his options. My, uh, my, my recommendation was to leave and to come back (laughs) on another day. (laughs) Go now, run. (laughs) Well, he didn't didn't know what he was getting himself into. And he like just kind of wanders up and it's like, I think it was like, like noon and that's not right. a great time to get in because we're we're loading in we're just loading in the first wave we're just we're we're finishing we usually have just finished seating the first wave of people and they have two and a half hours at their table and a lot of days they will take all two and a half hours and so you can imagine that um you know you don't start turning tables for a while and so that's kind of a, a bad time to to jump in line and i was like i'm going to recommend that you go do some wine tasting go hit some other breweries come back a different day and um and you'll you'll see that the the weight will be a lot less and and because you've never done this before I want you to have a great time and so I just want to make sure that you know we we like to make sure that we're managing expectations we'll put signs out that say you know from here it's two and a half hours um mm-hmm. Uh, for your listeners um, who've ever been to our Windsor Brewery, I don't know if anybody has. A Windsor Brewery is is our what we call new new mm. brewery. It's our dream brewery. It's really beautiful, and we we designed it from the ground up, and and we designed it um, for this release. With the the parking lot is oversized for the rest of the year. It's it's 
virtually empty <laughs> for the rest of the year. Not virtually, but the, we rarely like do we half fill the parking lot for the rest of the year. It's huge. Um, we have um, the whole front of the brewery has this giant sidewalk that snakes around the front of the brewery, which is designed for the Pliny the Younger line <clears throat> to go around the whole front of the brewery. <clears throat> and unfortunately, sometimes the line goes all the way out to the sidewalk and then down the street, <laughs> which it did on Saturday. Um, we have bathrooms that we designed um, to be, they're on electronic locks, and the bathrooms are designed to have an outdoor um, access that um, we keep open 24 seven during the planning the younger release. So there's clean, clean bathrooms that get cleaned every day that people can use if they're here, you know, overnight or in the middle of the night or two o'clock in the morning or whatever. And so this whole brewery um, on the hospitality side was designed for these two weeks. And and I, I can't tell you how excited I was um, the first year that we released Planning the Younger at both locations. So now we have it at our Santa Rosa location as well as the Windsor location. And the Windsor Brewery was designed also to relieve some pressure from downtown for Planning sure. the Younger as well as just in general. Um, I was standing up on the, we, we offer guided tours here and self-guided tours as well. I was standing up on the, uh, the guided tour walkway and I called our architect and um, it was like the first weekend of Planet of the Younger release 2019. And it was the first time we'd ever released it here because we'd just opened. And, um, and I said, Peter, it's working. Everything that we designed this brewery to do is working. It is firing on all cylinders. It is doing exactly what we designed it to do. Because you have a vision, right? You're like, I think, I think this is what's going to work best for you know, for this, like, I think this is how people are going to use this space, or I think that this is going to be, be the best way to design this. And we had designed this perfectly. We, the parking lot was, was full. The, um, the, the line of people was, was, you know, snaking around the front down, you know, in front of the brewery. Um, all the tours were booked up. The tours were going off every hour. There were people on the self-guided tour. There were people in the gift shop. The pub was full tasting room was full. It was just wild. It was so fun. And I was just so excited to see our dream come true. You know, like we had this vision, we had this dream, like we're going to, we can design this in such a way that we make it work for our guests and, um, and they have a better experience when they come here and they're not like trying to find parking or they don't know where to stand. Or they don't know where to be or there's nothing else to do. And, um, it was just really a, an exciting moment. Um, I don't think I answered your question, but that's a great story. <laughs> no, you, well, it was a, you, it was a better answer to a question I didn't even think to ask. So there you go. <laughs> Fantastic. I have one last question for you and I am going to need a direct answer on this. Knowing Everything you know about Pliny the Younger, I mean, since 2005, we're coming up on what? Oh my gosh, the 20th anniversary of Pliny Next the Younger. Year. This is 19 right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My goodness. Um, <clears throat> but uh, you've seen it uh, sort of be, you know, take on a life of its own, gather that momentum. Mm -hmm. If you had to wait in line for Pliny the Younger as just a rank and file customer, as a drinker, You've seen every year. What was the best? What was the easiest year to get Planet of the Young? It couldn't have been the first year. The first year sounds like it was terrible. Mangan. It was the worst year. <laughs> Which year would well, you choose well, if you uh, had to sneak the, in there? Well, 2005 to 2009 were great years. <laughs> no, no, no. That you can't. No, those are ruled out. 2010 onward. Yes, I didn't mean the first year. I meant the first crazy year. So from 2010 to 2023, which is where we're in now, yeah. there had to be years where it might have been a little easier. You know, I, I think if I was going to pick a year, it'd be weather related. You know, it'd have to be, um, Smart. it would have to be weather related. I mean, like the last, um, I don't know where your listeners live. If, if any listeners live, All in, over. if they, if anybody lives in, in California, we've, we've had a pretty rough, um, first start of the year. Um, we've had a lot of weather, um, a yeah. lot of record snowfalls, a lot of record cold temperatures and a lot of record rain. And, and yesterday was another one of those days, um, you know, we, we moved the release, um, last year, um, due to COVID. We, uh, we had, we didn't have it in 2021 because, because of, because we were shut down and because of COVID, sure. but last year we had it in 2022 and we moved it to late March because, um, we were supposed to release it the first Friday of February, but in January, um, we had to close both of our pubs because we had a major outbreak of COVID that, you remember that pandemic thing? Oh Yeah. <laughs> 
yeah. Turned sure, everybody's life bell. upside yeah, down. Yeah. yeah. So we, uh, we had to close because, um, not because of business restrictions, but because we didn't have any employees and you need employees to pull off a release like this. And so we ended up postponing, um, the release at the last minute and, um, and it had it in March and the, and the weather was great. The weather was really nice. We had a little bit of rain, but it was like spring rain and it was, it was really nice. And, um, and we were like, wow, this is great. So let's, uh, everybody's having a better time because they're not, it's not the dead of winter. It's not, you know, freezing, sleeting, cold rain sideways. It's, you know, this is the days are longer because time has changed and it's lighter later. And so let's, let's permanently move our release to late March. And uh, we'll do distribution in February to our accounts when they really need it the most in the dead of winter. And then we'll have uh, we'll have it in the spring. We'll do a spring release. It's beautiful in Sonoma County. Um, you know the uh, the vineyards are are starting to to uh, to leaf out a little bit. And there's mustard in the vineyards, and, and it's green. And it's such a pretty time here. Um, and so we moved it. <laughs> the weather, the weather has been dicey. And then yesterday it was just horrendous. It was like something, it was, it was just, everybody was just joking as I was, Vinny and I were soaked. We spent a ton of time outside just because we felt so bad for people being outside. And um, we spent a lot of time outside helping put up more easy ups and, and getting, you know, heaters and whatever was going on and inviting people to come inside to anywhere that they could get out of the elements. But, but it was just a joke because it was like, it was cold and it was super windy and it was raining really hard <laughs> for like yeah. the first half yeah, of yeah. the day. And so it was just funny. It was ironic that we had moved the uh, release to spring and, and the weather was just as crappy as it normally is in February. Um, so if I was to pick one, I, I can't really pick a year because um, I guess it would be a better, better weather year. But there's something about those days where the weather is just crap that there's this camaraderie and this bonding that happens with the experience because it's part of the story. It's part of the journey to get, to get inside, you know, it's, it's more. And like I said before, you know, the event is in line. It's business as usual inside. And, Mm -hmm. and that's where, that's where all the, where I think, you know, the magic is happening is, is out in the line and these friendships are being made and this bonding is happening. And when the weather is so, incredibly bad and there are people who don't even know each other who are huddled up you know next to each other and and um talking about you know where they're from yeah Yeah, just body (laughs) heat and you know but they like strike up conversations like hey where are you from how many times have you been and oh i'm I've never been before. What should I expect? Oh, let me tell you, this is my, this is my eighth year. And, you know, I love seeing people coming back and, and bringing newbies with them. We had, um, on Friday, the first day, uh, we had a party of, uh, 16, um, show up downtown at the Santa Rosa pub. And two of them, a couple had been coming for eight years. This was their eighth year. And over the years, they added more, more people, to their to their group and and this year they added a lot of people uh, to their group and there were 16 of them and uh, and they had the best time but it just started with two people who had had just so much fun year after year after year waiting in line rain or shine you know freezing cold temperatures whatever maybe they waited for eight hours maybe they waited for one hour who knows um, but they still had such a great time that they that they came back year after year and that that's the biggest compliment of all to us is that people come and they have such a good time that they, they continue to return. And, um, and like I tell our staff, like, Hey, you know, you know, this is our time to shine. This is our Super Bowl, And, um, a lot of it has to do with the service that we provide. You know, it's not just, most people don't come in and just slam a glass of younger, buy the two bottles and leave. That's pretty, pretty unusual. That would maybe be, I don't even know. Five people might do that <laughs> during the mm-hmm. whole release, but most of them want the full Russian River experience. We have over 20 beers on tap at both pubs right now. We have a bunch of new beers out that we always release. So we're always um, getting people to try other beers. A lot of sampler sets going out. Our sampler set is legendary. We do every single beer that we make on the sampler set. So our sampler set holds um, 18 beers. And if we have more than 18 beers, we have to like stack the other beers <laughs> in the middle. <laughs> It's quite the presentation. Um, so, so it's great. And, uh, you know, I'm just uh, really proud of that. And, um, yeah, so that's the scoop. And I hope 
you know, every year we're a little paranoid that nobody's going to show up. And, and this year they, they showed up again. So we're, we're they grateful. keep coming. They keep coming. So that means we're doing something right. And we're grateful. <laughs> I think you're doing a lot of things right. Natalie, thank you so much for joining us here on Tap Lines. It was a pleasure taking a small trip down memory lane just 13 <laughs> years ago, although it feels like forever ago, I'm sure. If, it, if you're <laughs> anything like me, it feels like an age ago. Yeah. Um, thanks so much for joining us and, and best of luck with the rest of your plan of the, Yelda, the uh, younger release this year. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's been a lot of fun and I hope you can come visit sometime. Soon. I'll be out there in line asking what the hell all these other people are there for. Yeah, well, they, you know what? They have a lot of time to tell you. So, and they're more than happy to talk to you. So come on out, do a podcast. Perfect. <laughs> Next year. All, all right. right. To date. <laughs> Taplines is recorded in Richmond, Virginia, and produced by yours truly and Darby Seaside, who, along with the talented Shane Farrick, composed our delightful soundtrack. Just listen to it. I also want to give a quick shout out to the entire Vine Pair team, and especially co-founders Adam Teeter and Josh Mallon, Editor-in-Chief Joanna Sherino, Managing Editor Tim McCurdy, and Art Director Danielle Grinberg, who designed our lovely Taplines logo. And of course, a big thank you to you, yes you listener, for spending time with us week in and week out. We literally couldn't do this without you. I'm Dave Infante, and I'll catch you next time.